the the, the title of this presentation, this, this this session, smart government of course versus I thought of smart goals. Uh, what are they supposed to be? Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, uh, realistic, and time bound. Uh, uh, I thought of that, and in some ways, it is not what we are here about, but in some ways, it is, they are very relevant. Uh, and, uh, but be that as it may, the role of government, smart or foolish, is to run the country. Uh, they are elected for that purpose. Uh, the government is responsible for developing and implementing uh, policies and for making laws. Our mandate, again, I, I very quickly, uh, we will talk about smart government in the context of smart soft power, uh, a pipeline for great talent, leadership, we're going to talk about the public service, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, the global model of Singapore, I hope you get time to touch on that, and I, even though it's not there, I hope you can also touch on how to avoid your kill. I was fascinated by that discussion this morning. Uh, this format is going to be, uh, I will invite, as I said, uh, Honorable Picardo to make some remarks for about five minutes, followed by Honorable uh, Kanadier, and then uh, Mr. Crumpler. Then we have a discussion, and then we open the floor up. I'm going to, not, I'm going to leave more than five minutes for discussion, because I know that this is the the, the time that many have waited for. And I don't think it's any accident that we must put this panel at this time of the day because we still have a, we have a room still overflowing. Uh, nobody will leave until this panel is finished. So there'll be lots of time for... <laughs> I know that because I know the gentleman. Uh, so there'll be lots of time for discussion. So enough from me. I now invite the Honorable Fabian Picardo to, to tell us about uh, smart government and what he considers to be the, the tenets and whatever he wants to say. So. Well, um, I think there must have been some mistake. I think my office communicated that I don't speak for less than 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I will try and compress those thoughts uh, into five minutes. <laughs> Um, and I want to start by putting something up as a tweet, um, which I made earlier, and my presentation today is going to be based on tweets about my remarks. Uh, because I think it's important that we embrace technology in everything that we do, and that we should lead by example. And if we're talking about people in our countries working with technology, then the least that we can do as leaders of government business is also to embrace technology. Okay. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, and really is to thank Orlando for the invitation and Russell for uh, making sure that I could be here uh, today. Uh, I found the morning hugely uh, educative to myself uh, and the afternoon a real eye-opener. I did not know that I had married something called a millennial. I did not realize, I did not realize that I was a generation Xer. I did not quite understand what this meant, but I think you've got us just right, and you really, you really explained a lot to us. Um, and thank you, Nikita, for helping me put this presentation together during the lunch hour. So, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the overseas territories um, in two and a half minutes, and then for the next two and a half minutes, talking about how we changed uh, government in Gibraltar since we were elected. And I want to start with the concept of David and Goliath, which Russell talked about this morning when he introduced the. Uh, the conference and the idea that we we might be David's facing Goliaths, something that I actually entirely reject for a particular reason. I don't believe that there are just Davids and Goliaths in the global economy today in the way that you might have believed some years ago. Just because a country is large does not mean that it is fleet of foot. Just because a country is small does not mean that it cannot achieve great things. And, and this is where I believe that microeconomies and micro states like uh, the overseas territories really do stand to make something big out of globalization because we have the ability to be fleeter of foot than large countries, we have the ability to move quickly, we can really legislate at a pace that cannot be seen in, in other places, therefore we can adapt quickly. In a world that is now defined by speed, 
the speed at which we get news, the speed at which we digest things, the need to multitask. It's not just women who have to do that anymore. Yeah. Boys have learned, had to learn how to do it too. Um, and that makes us, I think, um, something of uh, world leaders uh, in the way that we can deliver change. Now, um, I want to look at how we've done that in Gibraltar in a particular way uh, to ensure that we are never going to be roadkill in the international economy. Not even a mosquito dead on the windscreen of the international economy. <laughs> we're, we're going to be driving this international economy together with our colleagues in the other overseas territories. <laughs> let's, look, let's look, for example, at the, at the BDI that I came to 10 years ago and the law firms that were here and how they have grown. The law firm that I was employed by before I was elected in Gibraltar, Hassan, it's not well known internationally like Harney's, like Conyers, like Walker's, but it went from being a 12 lawyer firm in, in the 1990s to being over 85 lawyers now, 250 professionals. The growth that we've seen ourselves, the growth that you've seen yourselves, a lot of it homegrown. Some of it's important. It's important that in a globalized economy, we attract people from other jurisdictions that can add something to what we do. So that's not something to be afraid of. The way that we've changed our tourist product, for example, in Gibraltar in the past uh, two years, um, our previous administration was not enamored of niche tourism. But we had a leader in our community, Mr. Brian Callahan, who runs one of our hotels. He was tired of his hotel being empty in winter. So 10 years ago, he started the chess festival. It was small at the time. The Telegraph this year called it the best international open chess festival in the world. And we don't just fill his hotel, we fill every hotel in Gibraltar and every hotel in neighboring Spain as well for about 10 kilometers around us. Now, if we can be fleet of foot enough, we can achieve that. And in two years, we've introduced new niche tourism products to Gibraltar, like a music festival. We have some of the top artists in the world already in Gibraltar. We're going to welcome some great new artists this year. A jazz festival, an international literary festival. I'm very excited about some of the ideas that you're talking about here with food and wine. As you can see, I like my food. It's not, not a festival intended for me, but I think it's the sort of thing that people like. So when you look at all of those things, um, I think that you are absolutely right, uh, Premier, to have bet on Latin America as a place to which you need to aim your tourism product. Why? Because I have just, I got married in, in 2011. Um, oh. And in that year, in that year we, we traveled to Turkey. And all I could hear around me was Portuguese and Cantonese being spoken. All the big spenders were Portuguese, actually Brazilians, of course, speaking Portuguese. I was in Florida last week on my way here. And in the Sawgrass Mills Mall, Perhaps because I look like this, everybody thought I was Brazilian. And they would stop <laughs> and talk to me in Portuguese. And I would reply in Spanish. But it's incredible how all the top-end shops at Sawgrass Mills and at the Freedom Outlets in Orlando, all of them have people behind the counter who speak Brazil, uh, Portuguese, not Brazilian, of course. So yeah, there are movements here that we all need to tap into. We've introduced a visa waiver scheme for uh, Brazilians, and for Chinese people, and for Indian people, and for Russians, so that it's not difficult to get into our country, as long as they've got Schengen multiple entry visas, which ensure that the security of the individual that we're dealing with has been dealt with. Now, those are called the BRIC countries, of course, and everybody knows what that means, I don't need to define it for you. But for the reasons that Mrs. Smith has just outlined, I put it to you that, that we are actually quite a big player there ourselves. If the OT leaders can work together more closely, and Gibraltar has been responsible for not being a part of the OT group for the past uh, 15 years as it should be, and I'm very pleased that we're back. If we can work together, listen to this, and, and Mrs. Smith gave you an indication of my thinking on this. Imagine one country with half a million people that leads in captive insurance business, in company corporations, in uh, the, the hedge fund business, being the hedge fund capital of the world, that has the largest reserves of oil and fish stocks in the world, untapped, and that is the online Las Vegas of the world. That five OT territories with a total population of under half a million people. Shouldn't we be working together and sharing that wealth? 
because if we do, and we manage to harness that, and, and Orlando and Craig have been working together with me and other overseas territory leaders to see whether we can do that. Maybe people around the world will be talking about the Brico countries. <laughs> <laughs> Gibraltar has gone from being ninth on the list of GDP per capita around the world when I was elected to fourth. <laughs> Bermuda is third. Craig knows I don't like to come second to all. <laughs> Working together, the BVI, Gibraltar, Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, the Falkland Islands, the Turks and Caicos, St. Helena, Pitcairn, all of us together, we could be way up there in the top five, distributing wealth to our people to ensure that smart government gives back to its people. That doesn't mean there aren't challenges. And Gibraltar has become number one in online gaming by being the toughest regulator of online gaming in the world. And almost uh, 20 years ago, we thought our financial services business was over when the EU started its anti-money laundering aggressive approach. And Gibraltar thought this was the end. In fact, tough regulation in the EU, which means that Gibraltar has had to comply with all EU directives that were part of the EU, has actually made Gibraltar a stronger jurisdiction in terms of the financial services we offer from there. We're not looking at the numbers that you're looking at here. We're no longer offshore, it's a word we don't like. We're probably midshore now. 10% tax, it's a word, another word I discovered today. I'm going away with a new vocabulary. <laughs> Millennials, midshore, generation X. But regulation was a good thing. And Gibraltar became a place where people no longer said you would go to loan the money. Well, of course, the Spaniards constantly say that in their constant onslaught against Gibraltar, but anybody who is reasonable has taken us off their blacklist, has decided that Gibraltar is compliant, and what I say when I go around the world is that Gibraltar believes in a culture of compliance. And I know that's the language that you speak in the BVI also, it's the language that Orlando always speaks with, I see him speak internationally, and that is, in my view, the future for the overseas territories. Not an embarrassment to the United Kingdom, but something for the United Kingdom to be proud of, something that the United Kingdom can look at and say, those territories don't cost me a penny, and they make me proud to see what they have achieved. Now, in order to do that, it doesn't just require that we have strong private sector innovators. It requires that the public sector make itself available as a facilitator to the um, to the public sector, to the private sector in those overseas territories. And that's what I hope that we've been able to do. And I got so excited, I've forgotten to click and to show you my <laughs> tweets. <laughs> but uh, this is what I've been talking about, and I will hopefully now catch up with myself <laughs> with this tweet. Um, and I think it's fundamentally important that those who are in the public sector see themselves not as being in a job for life, but being in the job of facilitating those who are in the private sector delivering growth in our economy. I also think it's a fool's errand to believe that the biggest spending in your economy should always be the government, because in the long term, that is only going to deliver a deficit. And that's why I think working together, all of the OTs can learn from each other and what it is that they've done to deliver lower debt, to deliver streamlined public sectors. I'm working very closely with my own public sector civil servants to deliver new working hours, to deliver a more efficient government machinery. Um, that, I think, is the future. We've uh, set out an aim in our manifesto to halve our debt gross and to reduce our net debt by 10% by the date of the next election. Not only are we well on the way to achieving that, I think we're going to exceed that, but only because we're engaging with the public sector to deliver for the public sector and for the private sector. Now, how do we achieve uh, efficiency with the public sector? I don't think it's just about saying to civil servants, you've got to work harder, you've got to you know, realize that you're there to facilitate the private sector. I think it's about giving the uh, the public sector the tool, and that is a difficult thing. Um, in Gibraltar, there are 4,000 public servants. You know, we are the largest enterprise on the rock. We cannot change everybody's computer overnight because that's 4,000 new machines. You know, in my law firm, 250 people, we have a rolling scheme where we change somebody's machine you know, perhaps once every three or four years. 
So we need to roll out that type of change slowly. But what you cannot do is expect people to do a job if you don't give them the tools. And that means investing in the infrastructure, and in particular, the, the computer infrastructure that people are using. And I was elected, I found that there were civil servants, and everybody complains about civil servants in Gibraltar. They don't do any bloody work, one thing or the other, right? I found that there were civil servants who didn't have a PDF program on their machine, who had to send PDFs that they received from the private sector home to themselves to open up at home to come back in the morning or after lunch and then produce the document for an individual. Well, look, actually, that shows that people are concerned. They're investing their own time at home. They're using their own infrastructure at home to deliver. So we have to deliver the tools to the public sector um, in order to enable to allow them to do the work that they need to do. Now, if we do all that, then I believe that we will not be roadkill this century. I believe this is our century. With everything that we can do, this can be our century. And we can get stronger together, and we can get stronger internationally, and we can become a force to be reckoned with. Um, because I don't have 90 minutes, I'm going to call it <laughs> Thank you very much.